Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England. Our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. And whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. These podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them, but also tell us what you think. These are debates we all need to be part of. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. This week we continue our conversation with John Butler, 84-year-old YouTube sensation and author of the Shepherd Walwyn book, Wonders of Spiritual Unfoldment. In this conversation we explore the experiences he writes about in the first parts of Wonders, We explore his relationship with nature, his time as one of the first organic farmers in the 1960s, his collaboration with people like E.F. Schumacher, author of Small is Beautiful, and Lady Balfour, co-founder of the Soil Association. We also get into how he sees his spiritual work as an evolution of his farming work. Now the conversation follows on from our Meet the Author interview that we released some time ago, and that took place in his favourite church in Bakewell. But to continue the dialogue, we made our way to the top of John's favourite hill just outside Bakewell. Now this gave us some wind and insect noise, so apologies in advance for that. But the place has held a special meaning for John since he was a boy. So I begin the interview by asking him where he's taken us and what the place means to him. Well, it's really uh, from the church. You just look across the valley and there you see woods on the hillside and and just beyond the horizon, and this you come to this, this wonderful open space. <clears throat> and I first came up here as a boy of 12, I think, soon after we moved to Bakewell. And uh, I think it was up here that I really first fell in love with space. It, uh, it, uh, it was all open heathland then. It hadn't been ploughed up and reseeded as it is now. There were no fences. And um, there were lots of curlews and lapwings. And uh, oh, what a lovely place it was. And throughout my boyhood, in fact, ever since I've been coming up here and always feeling better. Um, Coming up from rather tense uh, family situations, uh, usually on my own, yes, I discovered the great comfort of silence and space. I've always loved those qualities. It's never been difficult for me. I always feel it's my real home. And when I started thinking, more in spiritual terms, I always felt this was my first church, really, up here. I was never too happy in a sort of social atmosphere of a, of a church services. I always felt closer to... I didn't really think in terms of meanings of things then. It was just a sort of natural boyish instinct, I suppose, to come up here. And here I am now as an old man, still doing the same thing. And I guess when you're when you're a boy, then this is an escape, right? And it's a space that isn't controlled by parents or. Well, I suppose it. Yes, I suppose it was a escape. Then I didn't I suppose I thought of it like that, but um, of course, much later on, I came to see that. There are really two great aspects to creation. There's the man-dominated creation, <laughs> and what you'd call the, or the man-dominated or the unnatural creation, <laughs> and the natural creation <laughs> where man is absent. And uh, I spent much of my life, because because uh, later on I I travelled much. I've been in many of them of the wild, open and wonderful places of the world and and always uh, always loved that instinctively. I look at a map and I look where there are no roads and no towns. I think that's the place to go. And, uh, and, and uh, 
Yes, always seeking the natural in contrast to the unnatural. <laughs> and I, I mean, in the in the book, you when I when I read the the passage about Africa, yes. you um you basically went to Africa and went where people weren't. That's right. Yes, I've always um, done that. And there's some there's some amazing. Um, let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, you talk about. Um, seeing an animal and learning about freedom from the animals. Mm -hmm. I know we're moving around a little bit, aren't we? But um, Africa. The freedom of these creatures helps restore one's own. Something disturbs them and they run, first a few, then all together, dust and hooves in perfect harmony. And this is, this is an example, just the next passage in Glimpses of Africa, chapter 11. It lightens as I drive, revealing dunes unearthly beautiful, each form so clear in shades of orange sand, mountains of sand continuing in line, in wave on wave, huge dunes far greater than anything I've ever seen before. Words fail, but I think of desert prophets who first wrote of God, inspired by similar scenes. Majesty, power, glory, might, and it's all here, so close to magnificence it merges into God. It's not belief, but fact. Yes, that's right. It is. It's, it's. I've never been too keen on belief and people saying you have to believe in God. That's never seemed very real to me. I've always thought of it as fact, as obvious, really. Africa was a wonderful uh, opportunity to, to. Uh, to really be close to what I've, I'm talking about, absence of man and the, the pure, as it was in the beginning, I remember, I, I, I thought this was how it, it was when God first, crea first made the creation and looked and saw that it was good. It hadn't somehow been corrupted by this influence of man. I think that's part of the magic of wild animals. When you see really wild animals in their wild setting, you know, somehow you draw near to fairy land. You, they, all these fairies, angels, purity, it all begins to make sense. They, it, it, they come together and you, and you understand, you suddenly realize this is, this is what it is. This is what it is. And why, why can't we be like this? Why are we so condemned to live in exile from this? And, and this led me to, to think ever more seriously of, of, of what it is that's wrong with man. Just walking up here just now, as well, feet trod on the grass, I remember one of my, the first great lessons when I was a farmer, Dad bought a few fields of grass uh, when I uh, came back from Australia when I was 21. And uh, so I had these, my first fields, and I was so proud of them. I just, you know, I was like a dog with two tails. And, uh, and then I, I realized that I couldn't walk across this grass that I loved so much with my big... Uh, because they were hobnailed boots in those days we wore, without hurting the grass. What a lesson that was. I couldn't walk across the grass without hurting it, without bruising it. So here was I loving the grass, almost worshipping the grass, yet destroying it with every step, just as we did walking up here, just from the pathway. Of course, most people walk on grass, you don't think about it. You don't understand what you're doing because we're so blinded. You know, we're present, but we're not present. We're absent. So we, we're insensitive to these things. And, um, and sometimes your understanding is open and you do feel it. And you then feel the, the really dreadful enormity of what I now realize the scripture calls sin. Sin is that which has absented us from, from spirit, which is God. 
you know, the fairies can dance over the flower, over and sit on the flowers and don't hurt them, do they? They, they don't damage the grass. So why do we? Why can't we be like the fairies? But of course, in our true nature, our true spiritual nature, we are. In true spiritual nature, I can dance over these lovely pastures and not disturb anything. And here I am in my corrupt human nature, fallen, as it's described, fallen from paradise, and I can't take a step without hurting something. So that really led me on to think seriously about the human condition and what can we do about it. And that's, I suppose, been my life's work, trying to come back to spirit, rediscover and find a way back to being spirit. Right, and you know, and going right back to the beginning then, because um, one thing I wanted to, to ask you about was you write in the book about how your mum said that you always knew you were going to be a farmer. Yes. From before you were born. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, this also was a, a wonderful thing for me to realise that, yes, of course, I, at first I was a farmer in the physical world. I was a young, strong man working with my hands with the soil, with forks and spades and things. Um, digging the ground, growing vegetables, keeping sheep particularly. And and, uh, and then I began to write a bit, and um, people came, and I'd, most people laughed at me, of course, at that time, but a few people were interested and encouraged me to talk, and gradually I was able to formulate my ideas. And uh, so I sort of expanded from physical into, I suppose, mental. And then life moved on, and uh, I began to look beyond my own few acres over the fence, to look to my neighbours, and, and think wider and wider. And so my farm sort of expanded. But the same sense of of uh, there was a phrase came into <laughs> use then. I knew the chap had invented it. A man called Schumacher, the tender, loving care (TLC), which I think summed up absolutely beautifully the whole sort of ethos of what was then began to be called organic farming, tender, loving care. And this TLC, at least in my case, began to expand beyond the, the farm to the whole sort of human situation, to the whole world, really. And so it's with exactly the same attitude that farming for me simply expanded from growing a few vegetables on my own few acres to this spiritual work which is raising the consciousness of, on a universal scale. You see, you're, if you think of it, you raise vegetables out of the earth, don't you? You help them to grow like that, and you encourage that growth by attending to the fertility of the ground. Well, the fertility of the ground is really the spirit of the ground. It's really the spiritual development of earth which manifests as fertility. That's why the whole process of composting and encouraging the, 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 the micro life of the soil, the worms, the bacteria, all the little bugs, they all help to build fertility which produce healthy crops. I can't talk forever about this. I'm sorry, I'll go on and on. But you see, in exactly the same way, our own spiritual development helps raise the consciousness of the world in which we live. And this is the great work. In this fallen world that has fallen from paradise, restoring it to God. And this is, of course, we come on to the great work of prayer. Mm. And, and it, it's the, so the, the farmers. Because the thing that, that really interested me was: that, did you, as a as a as an infant, did you tell your mum that you came here to be a farmer? Absolutely, I did. It was a funny thing. Yes, mum always said that. Uh, I, I think I once said to her, I knew before I was born that I was going to be a farmer. How did I know that? Where did that come from? I never doubted it. So, is that, I mean, are you talking there about your soul's journey then? That this was the... I don't know what I'm talking about with what I said. Yeah. Because there are, there are stories of, of children who, who remember either, you know, past lives, but also remember the... No, I don't remember past lives. No, but, but also I remember that, you know, they said, well, I've come here for this. And that they're, they're, 
it's, I don't know, if, you know, I don't know anything if whether it's true or or not. But the idea that you came in here to be a farmer and and you had the it was it Farmer Jones you had the, right, the first yes. experience with, yes. and that you and it wasn't it was a confirmation that when you when you read that in the book, it really is it's a yeah, yeah that's it that was yeah <laughs> <laughs> so and it's like so you knew, and then you experienced and you you know you got this wonderful wonderful description of this little boy walking home exhausted having done a man's a man's day's labor following the horse and um <laughs> just a stunning a stunning bit of literature really um and, that, and then you became a farmer yes yes that's right gosh how, how lovely that you remember that jonathan that does touch me yes it yes one of my first memories of so spending a day uh, with a couple of horses and a seed drill so, uh, so <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yes. Yes, I'm walking up and down behind with the farmer. Just feet trotting tread on the ground, eight horses' feet and four men's feet. And something entered into my soul. There's no greater experience than to spend all day walking up and down a field behind a pair of horses. I still think that to this day. I'd willing to swap all the glories of this world for that. <laughs> do, do you know, I, I was wondering about your mum and about what she was thinking, and, and it's like, you know, he's saying that, that, you know, little John saying that crazy thing again. Right, what can we do? Say what? Let's give him a day with the farmer, and so he can realise that he didn't want to be a farmer, and this, and then you come back, and it's like, yeah. I don't think I don't think it's too much to do with mummies. It was during the war, and I was pretty much free to do what I wanted, and uh, and I came and went. No, nobody thought of child abuse in those days. I don't think it existed. <laughs> I wandered wherever I wanted as a child, and uh, nobody ever did me any harm. The men were everybody I met was kind. I knew nothing but kindness as a child, and uh, this dear farmer who was always kind to me let me play and among the things I loved. But it was just to just to be quiet, which you didn't have any trouble with. No, I was always never what was there to talk about? I, I didn't know if there was no need to talk. I just was happy with the animals and the, the plants, the fields. No, I never talked very much. I was on my own. Never lonely. I just I remember it as a very happy childhood. Especially when uh, I was allowed, uh, when I had anything to do with the, with the lovely big cart horses on the farm, darling creatures. Hard to realise how much love we've lost when you think how nearly everybody who worked with horses loved them. You can't really not love those great, patient, lovely animals, did all the work before motor cars and engines did everything. <laughs> there's a, I remember there's a, there's a really very sad and poignant story of you when you were in, I think it was Peru, was it, when you, when you came across a horse that was, oh, yes. was really badly injured. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I'm, what I'm, just, I'm just thinking of, of the lessons of being a farmer yes. and what we can draw from that. So I think there's so, much, there's so much in the books and also in, I mean, in your other work, in, um, in um, Mystic Apprentice and, mm. and Mystic Beginnings. I know you go into a lot more detail about mm. about farming. I wondered if it would be helpful if we did if we just jumped over to South America and your experiences there and the the frustration you seem to feel about um, about helping others or making a difference. And yes, that was an important time. Um, I'd injured my back uh, when I was twenty one, and I was um, told I'd have to give up farming, which broke my heart at the time, but I didn't, of course, I kept, I kept going. But um, it, it did me, I, had, I spent a few years in the family firm in, in Sheffield, but I really uh, I didn't really, I wasn't happy there, and I'd look out of the window and long to be outside, and um, it was the time when the world was beginning to take notice of what was then called the Third World, and there were Oxfam began about then, and there were pictures of little hungry kids in the papers, adverts. So I determined to go off to South America and help to make the world a better place. I was full of confidence. I felt I knew how to 
Well, I was actually going to uh, Bolivia to take. They were giving away a thousand hectares of of uh, of of, uh, of jungle, a virgin jungle, to any settler who'd go and uh, and and uh, clear the land and, and grow crops. I was going to do that, but. Um, but uh, I met a Peruvian girl, so I ended up in Peru. <laughs> and um, uh, yes, I got involved with um, uh, the, the, the Andes are largely eroded there, you know, and I knew a bit about soil erosion. I had seen it in Australia. And so I, I got involved with planting trees from the Andes to try to control erosion. And uh, well, I had some small success, but not very much. And one day I was sitting on a mountainside, and, and I seemed to hear a voice which said, to make whole, be whole. And I saw myself as a rather immature young man with a lot of superficial knowledge, trying to help, in inverted commas, the local Indians who were... Uh, many of them much older and wiser than I was. And I'd already, somebody sent me a book that mentioned meditation. And uh, I be, be, something began to work in me. I began to I think I'd better do something to sort myself out before sorting the world out. So when my time in Peru ended, I came back and I looked for and found a school of meditation. And that's when the great adventure of meditation started. I was 26 years old. So that was what South America taught me, really. But you know, when I was reading the passage about um, when in the, in, you were asked, you, there, was a, there was a man who, who came along and, and said he wanted to kill you when you arrived. Yes, yes, but yes. by the end of it, he wanted you to stay. But you yes. felt you were, it was time to move on. And, and yes. what it did seem like is that you had made, or you'd, you'd facilitated the difference. You'd, you'd, your, your presence had attracted others. <laughs> and so there was a lot going on. But it wasn't, it wasn't necessary for you to be there anymore. Well, who knows, uh, Jonathan? Who knows? Who knows what uh, seeds we sow? Yes, in a way, I seem to not achieve anything very much, but I don't think much happens behind the scenes that we're not aware of. Yes, it was. It wasn't when I first arrived already, but I'd moved to a new place, and there were one evening there were a lot of drunken Indians came and and knocked me up and uh, and uh, <laughs> said they wanted to kill me. Well, <laughs> I was big and strong in those days. I didn't have much choice, did I? <laughs> so I clenched my fists. And <laughs> anyway, we, we settled down and started to talk and it, uh, they didn't kill me, but <laughs> I wouldn't say we became friends, but at least <laughs> we went our ways. <laughs> and... Uh, Yes, yeah. yes. Often the great, the great bullies of this life, when they, when they settle down, and, and uh, <laughs> they often become the leaders, don't they? <laughs> I don't think I've ever met a bad person here in all my life. A lot of people, you know, appear sort of unpleasant on first acquaintance, but when you get to know them, there's good in everyone. Everyone. So, so you, you, you're back from South Africa, South America, and you you, you you move and you start meditating at the school of meditation. Mm -hmm. um, at what point did you get the and you had the farm in Bakewell? Yes. That time on the showground. Yes. Um, that must have been about the same time. Yes. Um, so when, when, at what point then did you move to Bicker Fen? Oh, no, um, no, I had the farm, then bought the first fields when I was 21, is that oh, okay. uh, earlier than that? Right. Anyway, um, yes, uh, well, it was a family affair, the things went wrong with the family business, and uh, and uh, we had to, the family finances, of course, were shaken, and, um, and so we had to sell the farm. But at that time, there was a, 
a little cottage with just three acres of land um, that, uh, that Dad's great aunt had lived in on the Lincolnshire Fens. And uh, of course, uh, nobody thought of farming three acres. It was far too small. What can you do with that? But anyway, uh, at that time, I was going through a bit of a hermit phase. I was disillusioned with the, with the world and um, was ready to just retreat to a sort of solitary hermitage and so I went to live there and much to my amazement um, just be, well on that fertile soil you couldn't help just grow a few things and but I was going down to London to the school of meditation there regularly and one day I took a box of lettuce down and to my amazement, at the end of the evening, I left it downstairs in a race where people went and had a cup of tea. And the box was empty and there was a saucer full of coins. And I suddenly realised that there were people in the world who wanted produce grown as I wanted to grow it. Of course, I was the only countryman in the school. Everybody else were townies, but uh, I'd talk at people interested and I'd talk about farming. And... Uh, so they knew the way I thought about things. So I thought, well, good God, I could make, I could grow vegetables, couldn't I? So I started growing vegetables. Talk about not being unexpected, and so people uh, started labelling me as one of the first organic farmers. <laughs> well, I don't know about organic. I just thought of it as good farming, and uh, but I certainly loved the land. TLC, plenty of that. <laughs> mm. So, and so your approach then was was really just this awareness that that that, that man does man damages. Yes. So it's got a lot of it's got destructive power. Yes. And then we're often we're often we often ignore that yes. and pretend that it doesn't happen. Yes. But then you got into the the restoration or the creation of of what was what sounded and you know looking at the video as well that you've got on the on the website and um, and reading the other work and in in, in wonders as well is just what a beautiful how beautiful you made that well I think that that sort of came out of secondary effects I think <coughs> I just love the earth I really do I love earth do you know if you take a handful of earth and really look at it you'll find it's one of the most beautiful things you can there's no end to the wonder of Earth. And, and once, you know, even with your f eyes, you can see this myriad of little creatures that, uh, th that uh, create what's called a crumb structure. I remember once talking about the wonders of the, of the structures of the Earth to, to a very wise old lady. Lady Eve Balfour was one of the founders of the Soil Association. She, she said, yes, it's like a cathedral, isn't it? All turrets and passages and, and ups and downs. It's like a cathedral and we should treat it as such. That's exactly right. And, uh, and every little bacteria and bug you see that lives in the earth is, is a living creature. And, and if you put a great big clumsy foot on the, on the earth, let alone a tractor or some heavy machine. You crush it, don't you? Mm. So it's like running a, it's like running a bulldozer over a cathedral. That's what we're doing to the earth. And this compaction of the soil, it squeezes the life out of the soil. It not only kills the little creatures, but it crushes the, the ventilation. All the, the, it's like closing all the windows. You're crushing the roads. You're breaking all the, the structure of. Uh, that enables life to to take place, um, and it and it's absolutely un almost unbelievable. The more you come to realise the destruction of man, how we can't really function without destroying, and uh, and this led me ever more deeply to consider what is man, what. How do we get out of this mess? What's the answer? Um, how can I learn to farm without destroying? 
Well, of course, we can't really, because um, we are in this physical body. Um, you know, I can't cut, I can't eat a lettuce without killing it, can I? Everything I eat, I'm, I'm killing. If I eat a potato, I'm killing it. Or I'm let alone anything that comes from animals. So, here you come to understand that man is a sinner, as until it became politically unacceptable <laughs> in, you know, in modern factions. You know, people have realized much, I think much better that, that, that man is absent from his true estate, which is in spirit. I suppose this led me on from physical farming to spiritual farming, which is really prayer. That's exactly what prayer is. Prayer is farming in spirit. So I, I promise we'll get we'll get we're going to get back to that. And that, that that's part two of the book. I just want to hold your feet over the fire of this of the farming thing because there's something. It was actually I think it's actually your wife told the story, and I've labelled it somewhere. And I'm not i have not actually. Let me just find exactly what the story is. It was a story that your wife told about. I think it was the chicks. Um, oh yes, yes I do. Okay, so here it is from the Parish Magazine in September '74. This is the item for the for the you know, so 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 and the question is so if we're a sinner if we're we're sinners, then okay so what can we do, right and and if we're and if it's like well you know God plonks us on earth yo you're a bunch of sinners and it's like okay so now what so what now do I do is there any redemption on earth and here this is it said at the beginning of August one of our hens hatched twelve chicks from twelve eggs she brooded in the hen house and in a day or two was ready to bring her family into the field. This meant walking down a ladder. I went to help and found two chicks still in the house. Inside the house, I picked one up and put it on the ladder and off it went. The last one was upset and when put on the ladder, bounced back against my hand, wanting to come back into the house. I felt his tiny will pitted against mine and wondered what to do next. Then he heard the voice of his mother gently and steadily calling. I felt the tension leave his body. He followed the call, ran down the ladder and joined the family. When he followed his mother's voice, the chick's battle with me was over. His will, her will, and my will were united in one will. And then she says, this is just so beautiful. It says, perhaps our battles with husband, child, or neighbor can be dissolved by memory of our true direction towards truth, which is what we really seek. We may say, but how and where can I hear the voice of God? Well, isn't it singing all around us, all the time, waiting for us to listen, hear and follow, even if the way seems new and strange? Oh, she was a smasher. My, my first wife, she, she understood these things and we worked very well together on the farm. Yes. And, and there was a moment in the film um, where you look at, you, you, you both, you, you share a prayer and you, you say the prayer together, and then you look to each other, yes. and there's the look of such purpose and love in that in the in in that film and in the in the look in your face. And I just I really got the sense that you were doing God's work, yes. and you, 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 my being so very patient and and humble, and literally getting onto your knees um, and doing the work and and honoring the, honoring all creatures. Um, and, and seeing what their will was and, and at times shaping it, but also just, and, and you were saying about how it's important is to listen. So you said that you listen to the plans and they tell you what to do. Well, I hope it doesn't sound too silly, but... But yes, just be aware of them. I mean... Uh... Look, when I just lower my eyes, look, there's there's a, there's a seeding dock just in front of me, just nodding in the wind. Well, I'm not doing anything to it, but but I love it. I'm just looking at it, and in that look, there's love and almost worship, isn't there? It's it's almost unbelievably beautiful. 
We just look at anything, it is, isn't it? Whatever we look at is beautiful if you, if you look at it. If you even just hold up a pencil or something, or look at my fingernail, it's absolutely miraculous, isn't it? Who could ever have dreamed anything so wonderful as a, as a hand could exist? This dear old hand of mine for 84 years has done things and I've hardly noticed it. Talk about a good servant. And this grass. Honestly, we live in a world of... If we really saw what's in front of us, you know, I think we'd just burst because it's too wonderful mm. for us to contain. It, it, you look like you were going to burst on the farm in that in that film. There were moments when you just you were just overflowing, and and yet also, I mean, Shirley said how you were, you know, you, and you were saying you could be a bit brutish. You were when she arrived. Mm. You were you've been, you've been five five years on your Todd. <laughs> <laughs> growing vegetables <laughs> and you could you found it difficult to speak <laughs> yes I've never have found it very, you think I'm gambling away now but, but actually I'm much more naturally oh. silent I think you know and I was thinking do you know John never talked he doesn't really talk about angels and given that he's so you know he has such experience and I'm thinking well bloody Shirley putting up with that <laughs> <laughs> putting up with it exactly. Oh, Shirley. Poor you know, Shirley. <laughs> she was there. You were, you were there tending to the flocks and she was there tending to you, wasn't she? Drawing you back out of yourself. And, <laughs> uh, just wondrous. Just absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit our website, www.shepherdwalwyn.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are also on the website. And if you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Spotify to give us a review. It's surprisingly helpful in getting the ideas out there. So until next time, keep reading. <laughs>